30. <coughs> so I tried to show last time that uh, the processing rate means that for structural materials that you have to produce in, you know, thousands of cubic meters of material, large volumes, um, you really just can't start with vapor phase, really for two reasons. One is it's just too slow. You can't get enough atoms there fast enough. Even at room temperature, there's about a thousand fold difference between the density of a gas and the density of a condensed phase. The typical number for methane, liquid natural gas, is 800 at room temperature. There's an 800 uh, fold volume change. But just whether it's 800 or whether it's 1,000, there's about a 1,000 fold change, and therefore there's at least a 1,000 fold in processing compared to pouring a liquid as opposed to depositing a va vapor. But in fact, the vapors are usually deposited a lot less than 100% concentration in air. They're, they, they're at a very low partial pressure, which could be 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6 of an atmosphere if you're doing vapor phase processing. So if you have 1 1,000th the density, but then you have a partial pressure that's 1 1,000th or 1 1 millionth, you can have a processing rate that's 1 million times less or a billion times less. I mean, it's much slower. And so vapor phase processing for you can put coatings on structural materials to try to uh, improve their corrosion resistance or their reflectivity or optical property. You know, that reflectivity is optical, but you know, you can change some other properties. But as a basic structural material to build a bridge that's going to go across a river, you're going to do it by pouring liquid. Okay, start out by pouring liquid. So today, oh, the, that's one of the reasons. And the second reason is just the energy cost. To get something into the vapor phase takes 10 times the energy of getting something into the liquid phase. You've got to break 10 times as many bonds because you've got to break every bond, whereas in a liquid you only have to break about 10% of the bonds from a solid. And I showed you a little graphic on that. So the energy cost is, is tremendous and the processing rate is slow and therefore vapor phase processing is something we do for functional materials that have extremely high value added, like semiconductors, okay, that are a million times as valuable per pound or per unit volume. Well, another way to look at this, <coughs> and this is actually out of a book on selection, of material selection by Mike Ashby, who used to be at Harvard and then he just retired a few years ago from University of Cambridge, but uh, this is $1980 equivalent down here, but the the energy content in gigajoules per ton, uh, he's got various things, and these are for structural materials like gravel. All you have to do is crush the rock. Not a lot of energy, there's a lot of force, but on a per pound basis, not a lot of energy. Aluminum, which aluminum oxide is very stable, and that's what you start with out of nature, that's what you mine out of the ground, and it takes a lot of energy to make aluminum metal out of aluminum oxide that you get from the ground. Copper, at that time it was 100 rising to about 500. That's because we've used up most of the good copper ores in the world. Really good copper ores came out of the Congo, the Belgian Congo, which is what, Zaire now? Whatever the name of it is. Central Africa, right? Where they're having all the wars all the time. Um, in any case, they used to have 6% copper ores. Well, if you go to the largest copper mine in the United States, which is still in operation, it's the Bingham Mine right outside Salt Lake City. If you've ever flown the right way into Salt Lake City, you look at the world's deepest pit, okay? It goes down, I don't know, 300 feet down, okay? Um, well, the Bingham Mine is like less than a half percent copper in the ore. Well, I mean, gold, we mine gold out of ores that are even less than that in parts per million, but gold is 10,000 times as valuable per atom as copper. Um, so there's a lot of energy content in the copper just in the mining. In aluminum, it's basically getting the oxygen out of the aluminum oxide. Plastics, that's basically the energy content that you would get if you just burned it as, as a barrel of oil, okay, plus the processing of the plastic. 
steel is around 50 and remember steel is the high volume material in the world other than uh, gravel and cement we haven't talked to, I don't know what the numbers are for gravel, I don't know if I've, anyone, I've ever seen that somewhere, but cement's about two billion tons a year, steel's about a billion tons per year. Well, back in 1980, at $4.4 per gigajoule, steel would be about $220 of energy cost per ton. And that was about right back then. Okay, the, the ore might cost you $100, the energy might cost you $200, you might buy the finished steel at $400 a ton because there was some other processing to make it into some shape and everything. Um, aluminum at $4.4 times 300 back in 1980 you'd have $1,400 of energy cost and at the time aluminum would cost you um, the cheapest aluminum back then would be about a dollar a pound, okay? So steel might be 20, 30 cents a pound, aluminum might be a dollar a pound, aluminum's got one-third the density, or one forty percent of the density, so you're getting more volume per pound, but it's still a lot more expensive, okay? <clears throat> now aluminum's up around two bucks a pound, and steel's up around 50 cents a pound, or something like that, okay? depending on the type of steel and, and whatnot. But there's inherently a lot of energy, and in fact, energy costs have become the dominant factor, whereas, I think I may have mentioned, when I went to work for a steel company in the, early, in the mid 70s, it was about 45% ore, raw materials, 45% energy, and 10% profit for a steel company back then. Um, Today it's about 90% energy cost. Okay, raw materials really don't are not that significant, and that's partly because the only industry over the last 30 years that has exceeded the productivity of the manufacturing sector is the mining sector. If you look at the productivity over the last 20, 30, 40, 20, 30 years in the service sector which is, you know, doctors, uh, uh, insurance companies, Wall Street, and everything else. The productivity growth, anybody know what office productivity? Has been, it's been around 0%. No productivity growth whatsoever. You know in the medical business it's going down, right? In the the financial sector, maybe some people are getting rich, but the productivity growth is, is not there. And they always say, well, we got computers now. We're more efficient at screwing people, okay, um, in, the, in the financial industry. In the manufacturing industry, anybody have any idea what it is? It's been about 4% productivity growth. I'll show you that in a little bit. In the mining industry, it's been about 6% productivity growth. So you average that over 20 years and you find that ore costs you, you know, one third as much as it did 20 years ago. Okay? 0.6 to the, or 1.06 to the 20th power. And you do it on your, you know, on your uh, HP calculator. Um, so, and manufacturing productivity has also gone up dramatically. If you actually, you know, it turns out before the Chinese started blowing away the metals market about four or five years ago, uh, if you went back to, in 2000, a ton of steel cost you about half the price in real dollars of what it cost in 1980. Okay, if you took out the inflation rates. Okay, and that's because the productivity increases. But it turns out if you look at this kind of plot, which I showed you last time, which is pounds per year used versus dollars per pound, uh, gravel is up, this is not my favorite version of this, but uh, stone, okay, this is stone right here. Very low cost because it has very low energy cost, cement, steel, okay. These things have all benefited from better mining costs, and things up here, 
uh, have gotten more expensive in a sense uh, because they have more energy content in them. Because energy cost has become the big push or a big factor in the cost of materials over the last 20, 30 years. Now, if we go, and I also pointed out this last time that steel is 95 pounds out of every 100 pounds of metal, aluminum is less than 2%, copper's just over 1%. Stainless steels are about 10% of that 95%. Question? Yep. Yep. This one? Right. Oh, you read it? Oh. So it says that yeah. Yeah, but you have to wait for the new design, okay? At well, and that uh, that four dollars a gallon. That that article was written originally. Those numbers were good from the mid '90s, okay? And so the the break-even point right now might be six dollars a gallon. But in fact, <coughs> gas is has been in Norway or whatever, you know, six or eight dollars a gallon for years. But the thing is, the United States is the market where everybody dumps their cars. Okay, and we have gasoline prices that are less than three dollars a gallon. That's why people make steel cars. You don't see all aluminum Ford Tauruses. Okay, the reason you don't is because or you don't see an all-aluminum Ford uh, Toyota Corolla or Camry. And the reason is you can't make a $20,000 car out of aluminum. Okay, if it, and actually you haven't done the material selection lecture, but that was the one I thought you were going to start doing, but, but I go through all of that, okay, in, in a lot more detail. Uh, aluminum is just too expensive to make a low-priced car. Hey, all-aluminum Audis, Hey, if I want to make a forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollar car, sure I can make it out of aluminum. Okay, shoot the body in white, which is the basic metal structure for a unibody car, only costs about a thousand, two thousand dollars out of steel. But if it costs two or th if it costs four thousand dollars out of aluminum, and you're trying to sell the car for twenty thousand dollars, you can't afford an extra two thousand dollars worth of aluminum. But if you're selling an Audi for $40,000, who cares about a lousy $2,000? The person who's buying an Audi for $40,000, they're pretty much insensitive of whether it's $40,000 or $42,000 for that car, right? But the person buying a Taurus at $20,000, they care, right? Do they make Audis out of aluminum? Yeah, Audis, yeah, that's a big deal. Audis are almost all aluminum. Audi and Alcoa had a big thing back in the 90s. <coughs> Uh, actually, I used to say that the break-even point was three dollars, okay? And I gave my talk at a metallurgical conference, and Peter Breidenbaugh, who was a graduate of this department at the time, was senior executive VP of Alcoa for, he had the longest title, I, research, development, safety, technology, environment, and something else, you know. Uh, anyway, so Peter was giving a talk in the same session, and I was talking about how you're not going to make all aluminum cars for Tauruses, okay? Because it's too expensive. And afterward, and Peter was giving, coming in to give a talk about all aluminum vehicles and all the work they were doing with Audi to make all aluminum cars and stuff. And he came up to me afterwards and he says, it's not $3 a pound, Tom, it's $4 a pound is the transition. He admitted it was even higher than what I had estimated, and, but I used his $4 number, okay? Well, that's a mid-90s number. So <clears throat> the whole thing in the material selection part of the lectures, which you'll get at some point, um, basically says, you know, you have, to be, you have to be careful when you start talking about prices of things. I can talk about a ship or a railroad where I could be talking about 20 cents a pound is the value of a weight of a pound saved over the life of the vehicle. I'm talking a commercial ship, a freighter or something, okay, cargo carrier versus a spacecraft where it's twenty thousand dollars a pound they're two different beasts okay i mean they clearly are but wall street doesn't understand that difference they can't tell the difference between twenty cents and twenty thousand dollars i mean it's, you would hope so. it's all you would hope they could but they don't understand it in a technological sense okay um anyway 
I, I harangue on that in those other lectures, so let me not harangue here. I could go on for quite a while on that, but you'll see some of that. Um, so anyway, um, getting back to, because I want to get into casting and how we make things. Anybody, but that's a good qu your, your question was a good question. Any other questions? I don't want to stifle questions. I just don't want you to... There's going to be enough redundancy. Although some of these stories, you know, the stories don't change that much. But there are little differences each time I tell them. Uh, who knows what the truth is? Um, okay, well, you're not going to be able to read this, but I don't, I don't care that you be able to read everything. This is something that came out of modern casting, uh, and it's the pounds of cast metal, world casting production in 2004, 2005. And gray iron castings, 40 million tons. Ductile iron, which is just a better grade, 20 million tons. Malleable iron, which is expensive, requires a furnace to heat treat for long hours, has dropped to a million tons. Steel, 9 million tons. Aluminum, 12 million tons. There's a problem with this graph. This is out of, a, this is out of the metals handbook. 10th edition, okay? And they got their source is modern casting. Anybody know what the difference, the problem here is? I told you we make a billion tons of steel. And they say that the steel castings output is 10 million tons, or 9 million tons. What's the problem? They say 12 million tons, they say aluminum's more than steel. Pardon me? The only steel they're talking about is where the final product is a cast shape of steel. They don't care about whether you made a plate or an I-beam out of steel. These are the casters. They only count the steels that were cast as a piece of steel. But in aluminum, where everything is cast, that's 12 million tons of, of aluminum that was produced in the world. Much of it ended up in Audis as sheet metal, okay? What's the largest use of aluminum in the world? Largest single fraction, 40% of all aluminum goes into what? Beverage cans. Aluminum cans, 40% of all aluminum production goes into cans, okay? All of that started out as a casting and it's part, all those beverage cans are part of this 12 million tons. This number should be a billion, uh, should be a billion tons, not 10 million tons because they're comparing apples and oranges. This is what sold as a casting. This is all the aluminum that was cast for any application, even sh as sheet metal or anything else. So you have to be careful. <coughs> uh, just because it's in a handbook, just because, because it comes from a reliable source, doesn't mean it's reliable. Which maybe I'll, <coughs> I'll go and give you an aside once. This happened to me a couple of times. Well, actually, maybe I'll tell both of them. I don't know. Um, back in the, the late 70s, I was giving some talk at a welding conference, and I decided I wanted to know, well, how many welders are there in the United States? Okay? So how would you estimate that? Yeah, but there's lots of people who weld who never graduated from some college. I mean, I mean college graduates don't correlate with with the professions. I went to the number of pounds of electrodes that were sold. Right? So he, there has to be someone who's consuming these electrodes, right? Coming yeah, and yeah, so I went and I divided the numbers knowing how much metal a guy could lay down in a day and I came up with a number like 800,000 or something. Okay, people, full-time welding. Except not everybody's a full-time welder, right? And I said, well, maybe about half a million of them are full-time welders. You go to a shipyard or John Deere, and they got guys who are welders, okay? And they just weld, right? I do that all day. But if I, some farmer or somebody, he welds two hours a week, okay? Or some auto mechanic or something. So I, I just kind of thought, well... There's got to be about two million welders, probably half a million full-time welders and one and a half million part-time welders, okay? And of course, there's some people who weld one, one hour a month, but are you going to include those on people who you call welders? Okay, 
So anyway, I get up and I give this talk about those two million welders. About 1990, about 12 years later, they come up with a new edition of the welding handbook and I, I get it and I'm flipping through it and it says, there are about two million welders in the United States and it says Bureau of Labor Statistics, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. And I thought, well, hey, they got the same number I did. So I call up the American Welding Society and say, where'd you get this Bureau of Labor Statistics? What's the reference on that? And they said, you. <laughs> <laughs> the Amer Bureau of Labor Statistics had called up one of the number, and the no only number they had ever heard was me. <laughs> and so they gave it to them. But they didn't reference me in the welding handbook. They well referenced the, gov referenced the government, right? Because they're more reliable, right? Um, the other uh, reference was uh, this guy Clayton Christensen up here at Harvard Business School. He's been chair of the faculty. He, some people say he's the greatest business school professor in the country right now. He wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma 15, 20 years ago. Well, I've known Clayton since he was a graduate student. He just lives up the street from me. I haven't spent time in a meeting with him since yesterday morning. Okay. Um, very nice guy, but anyway, back when he was writing the book, Innovator's Dilemma, my daughter, who's now in her mid-30s, um, was a college student, and she was working, she needed a job one summer, and Clayton gave her a job doing research for his book. One of the sections in his book, his examples, is the steel industry, okay, and how the big integrated producers didn't innovate, and the, the little electric furnace steel makers kind of did innovate, and that's what his whole book's about, The Innovator's Dilemma. Anyway, he had asked Rebecca to go find out what it cost to build a steel mill, an integrated big steel mill. And she came home one night and said, Dad, I can't find it anywhere, do you know? I said, sure, Rebecca, I got a slide in my office. So I, I bring in a copy of the slide. This slide was made in Saginaw, Michigan, in the airport, when I was there visiting General Motors with one of my graduate students. And I wanted him to do a, we were talking about what his thesis was going to be, and, and I kind of just jotted down what it costs to build an integrated steel plant versus build a mini mill, and people were talking about micro mills back then. And I just kind of pulled the numbers, you know, out of the air. Well, they weren't completely out of the air, it's my best estimate. It cost $15 billion to build an integrated steel plant in the mid-90s. Um, I know what it costs to build a steel plant, the last steel plant ever built by a company in the world was the Bethlehem Steel Burns Harbor plant in 1965. It cost six billion dollars. Burns Harbor, Indiana. And you just take inflation and stuff. So it's 15 billion to build one today. Or actually, right today it's probably 20, 25 billion, but in the mid 90s. So my number's not way off, and of course they're, you know, there are plants and there are plants, and some are a little bigger than others, but $15 billion order of magnitude is the right type of number. And so I gave this slide to Rebecca, and if you look in Clayton's book, there I'm referenced for the cost of a steel plan. Okay? And I know that I just sort of pulled this out of the air. It wasn't completely, I didn't pull, I didn't pull it out of somewhere else, okay, <laughs> uh, out of my anatomy, but I mean, I had a basis for it. But now it's referenced in this great management text, <coughs> okay? Um, so be careful when you see numbers, just like this 10, 10 million tons. No, I only tell my students about it because, I mean, hey, Clayton wrote it in his book. It must be the gospel, <laughs> right? Clayton doesn't even know this story, okay? It's his book, okay? All he wanted was a reference. I'm the professor from professor of metallurgy from MIT. Who would know better, right? And in fact, I'll bet you I'm right. Now, let me finish that story. Why has we've had new steel mills built since 1965? Posco, the world's largest steel company in Pohang, Korea, built a steel mill in the 1970s. But Posco Steel was not bankroll, bankrolled by a bunch of financial people was bankrolled by the Korean government. There have been probably a dozen steel mills built in the world since 1965, Greenfield sites, but not a single one has been built by a company that was risking shareholder money. It was countries 
who were building a steel mill because they saw steel as vital to the growth of their nation. Okay? And why is that? Well, once you get to the 10, 15, 20 billion dollar range, very few, very few companies are willing to risk that type of investment. But if you're in the aircraft business, Boeing has to do it when they come out with a Dreamliner. That's a 20 billion dollar investment. It's supposed to be 10 billion, but anyway. Um, uh, Intel, a new fab, over 10 billion dollars. There are only a few companies in the world that are profitable enough to be able to take the risk of a ten billion dollar investment. Usually it takes a nation to do that. So when we talk, and one of the things I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get across today when I finally get to today's lecture, <laughs> okay, is the magnitude of some of these industries in structural materials. It's not a small business. These are businesses where running a blast furnace can be a value of $100,000 an hour. Now, you, you guys are in the Navy. What costs the Navy $100,000 an hour to run? I was going to say a carrier. One carrier. A reactor is 30%. Well, okay. No, no, okay, but... Okay, well, so 30% is basically full, full tilt for a reactor, here's what you're telling me. I mean, well, okay, well, if that's what it is, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know, I haven't figured out a reactor, uh, but if I got 5,000 personnel on a, sh on a carrier, okay, and you just start talking the operations, and whether it's 100,000 or 200,000, well, maybe running that reactor is 50% of the cost of running the ship, okay? But I was just figuring, I got a $15 billion investment in that ship, and I got to amortize it over 40 years. And I could do all the, and I could run through those numbers. I mean, a kid in high school, if you taught him how, could do it, right? It's not hard, but, and you got how many re, uh, carriers now? 12? 11? 12? I mean, so you're talking a million dollars an hour, or $2 million an hour, just for the carriers without the battle groups that go with them, right? So it starts, you want to start, I mean, it takes a nation. You know, Hillary, wasn't it Hillary wrote the book, It Takes a Village, right? It takes a nation to run a, run a carrier. Um, <coughs> and it takes a nation to build a big steel mill uh, nowadays. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, I want to now talk about how do we do casting. And since 95% of all casting is basically making steel. I'm not trying to emphasize steel too much, but let's face it, there's a lot of steel in the world. Um, so I'm going to talk about steel because you guys are going to be involved in buying lots of steel, or working with lots of steel, whether you buy it or not. Steel is made from three things, iron ore, limestone, and coal. And if you go up here, they talked about uh, Saugus Ironworks, they basically were cutting trees, not coal. They were making charcoal, but you need an energy source. And traditionally that was coal. They talked about uh, the bogs in Saugus. They could get iron ore and limestone. There's limestone all over New England. Okay. This is, limestone is the flux. The iron ore produces the iron. In the old, in the, the coal, they had to put in coke ovens not to, well, the coal, the coal ordinarily has all kinds of volatile components. So you basically do the same thing with coal that you do with, char with wood for charcoal. You burn off all the volatiles in a reduced oxygen environment. It's called a coke oven. If you want to see a carcinogen factory, it's a coke oven, okay? It puts out, I mean, you know, when I moved to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, you could smell the coke ovens all over town just the sweet smell of sulfur, okay? Um, and in fact, there's a whole area of chemistry dealing with um, uh, volatile carbon, or what do they call it? Co coal tar, okay? If you go back in 1900, you would have taken courses at MIT in coal tar chemistry, and that's the volatiles that come off at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit off the, the stack. And what you're left over is carbon similar to charcoal, but it came from coal and we call it coke, 
okay? And you take that and you crush the limestone, you don't have to do much more than that. Today we have to take iron ore from different parts of the world and we have to center it, we have to grind it and center it and make it into pellets. And they just look like little, little, uh, they used to be golf ball size, now they're smaller than that so they can get faster reactivity. Uh, but, you know, uh, marble size pellets of iron ore. In the old days, anyone ever heard of the Masabi Range in Minnesota? There was an iron ore range in Minnesota that was, the iron ore was so, so pure, all you had to do was crush it up like limestone and stick it in your blast furnace. But they ran out of the Masabi Range right after World War II. We just mined it into extinction. And they basically still had lots of iron ore up in Minnesota. And they, the Great Lakes, were a huge shipping going from Minnesota to Pittsburgh to Chicago, you know, whatever. Yep. I'm going to talk about that. Hold, hold that question, okay? But this was, this was virgin ore, okay? Now, you then have to put those three things into a blast furnace. This is about 40 stories tall, and today a good blast furnace probably costs you two, three, four, five billion dollars, okay, depending on the size. A big blast furnace will have 5,000 cubic meter internal volume. That's pretty good size, okay? And it will produce five million tons a year. So what's, uh, what's that, 10,000 tons a day, 15,000 tons a day of of, iron, car, of cast iron. Now this all comes, the blast furnace is 100% ore and it's all virgin steel, virgin iron that goes to the steel, the steel refinery and the, the steel, steel is made by three processes or it was electric furnace, open hearth and basic oxygen furnace and they had to add some more flux into all of these the electric furnace can start, you could start with pig iron, but that's an expensive way to do it. Pig iron back 30 years ago was, at Bethlehem Steel when I worked there, actually yeah, 35 years ago, we used to figure $180 a ton for the cast iron coming out of the blast furnace. Okay, so 10,000 tons a day in a big blast furnace, $180 a ton, what's that? Two hundred million dollars a day, or so? No, that's not two hundred million. It's twenty million dollars a day, something, whatever it is. It's a lot of money, okay? And that's where you get your million dollars. Actually, that blast furnace may be costing you. Maybe I should have multiplied this out. Ten thousand tons times two hundred dollars is twenty million dollars, isn't it? Okay. So that's a million dollars an hour for a big blast furnace. The small ones we had at Bethlehem Steel, which were built in 1911, they were very proud of their ancient technology. Um, they were, believe me. Um, we're only worth $100,000 a day, an hour. <clears throat> but a big blast furnace today is a million dollars an hour. It costs more than a carrier to run, right? Um, but the electric furnace can take anywhere from zero to 100% scrap. Typically they take 100% scrap. The, the open hearth used to take essentially 70 to 80 percent virgin cast iron from the blast furnace and couldn't take more than 20 or 30 percent scrap. The basic open hearth, and I'm going to talk about what these are, can take about 30 percent scrap, has to take 70 percent virgin ore. Now one of the problems and one of the things that changed in the world, before 1880 we didn't have a steel industry in the world. Andrew Carnegie became the Bill Gates of his day. He was the richest man in the world. Okay, I don't know if Bill Gates is still the richest, maybe Warren Buffett. No, actually, it's some guy in Mexico. Okay, okay, so drugs is the biggest business today. Uh, no, he's actually, you know, communication, sorry. Well, you have to communicate to get those drugs across the border. Um, <laughs> um, we know how important C5I is right now, right? Uh, uh, in any case, the, uh, what happened is 
they now in the United States we put a hundred million ton we, we use a hundred million tons of steel a year that's our consumption per year now some of that steel lasts a hundred years before it's recycled some of it lasts 30 years but if you've been putting and you weren't putting a hundred million tons in for the first half of the 20th century you're maybe only putting 50 million tons a year in but the second half we were certainly putting in a hundred million tons so that's so you take a hundred million tons times um, uh, you take 50 million tons times a hundred years and that's 50 billion tons of steel but that has to be recycled and in fact it turns out 70 to 80 percent of all the steel that we produce is recycled and it has to be can you imagine the size of the landfills if you couldn't recycle steel well you can't imagine the size of it because concrete can't be recycled and so cement we're putting two billion tons into the environment worldwide in a year and it, there's no way to recycle cement you can crush it up and make aggregate for roads but you can't pave the whole world there wouldn't be room for trees yeah breakwaters yeah yeah that's because they, they call it an artificial reef for the environmentalist okay because otherwise they're not gonna allow you to dump trash in the ocean but if you're building an artificial reef that's different well it actually is not particularly harmful concrete is just you know a, a modified form it started out as limestone and it ends up as calcium hydroxide it's not a terrible thing but just think about we don't recycle a lot of steel a lot of concrete but we're using twice as much of that as we do steel but if you start thinking about what happened in the 1960s and 70s the cost of scrap dropped dramatically one of the reasons people say the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor was because we were starting to put restrictions on the amount of scrap steel that we would sell to Japan remember that story we were the consumer the world's consumer of steel for the first half of the 20th century we were producing the scrap that was coming back after 20 or 30 years of use we had all the steel scrap compared to most of the rest of the world we were withholding it this wasn't the only reason for the bombing Pearl Harbor but it was one if you read the historians we put some restrictions on on the amount of scrap they could buy and that was fueling their industry okay well in any case so you have to understand the steel industry is so huge it actually controlled a lot of the world's commerce in 1962 US Steel wanted to raise the price of steel and what did President Kennedy do? Well, none of you were born in 62, but I was. There was a big battle between the President of the United States and the President of the U.S. Steel, and Kennedy forced the U.S. Steel industry to roll back its prices to their old prices. Because he said, if they raise the price of steel, it would be inflationary to the world economy. It's the same thing as the oil prices today. And he could control U.S. Steel. He can't control OPEC, okay? and that's the difference in politics between those two but oil you could pump it out of the ground for for a nickel a barrel back in 1960 and we had plenty in Texas and Saudi Arabia had even more but then when oil became scarce now energy is the big thing and not steel okay you have to remember that after World War II the United States controlled 75 percent of the world's steel production why Nope, we bombed out all the other capacity in all the other countries. If you remember, we didn't have a war on, here, on our turf, right? There was not a single steel mill bombed in the United States. We didn't lose a single steel mill. We did build a lot of capacity in World War II, you're right. But it's not what we built, it's what we destroyed. <laughs> okay? So, and I like to tell the story of how in 1975, when I went to work for Bethlehem Steel, the managers who had been hired in 1945, right after the war, were now the leaders of US of Bethlehem Steel and US Steel and they still had the mindset that whatever they did they were the king they now in 1975 controlled 25 percent of the world's steel production and everybody else was making steel in modern plants that they had built since World War II 
And they were, Bethlehem Steel was very proud that our Coke ovens were built in 1910 and our blast furnaces were built in 1911. And I went to a seminar as a new hiree where the vice president of finance said, it cost us nothing to make steel because our plants were fully depreciated. And I was stupid enough to raise my hand and say, excuse me, sir, I mean, I was only 24 years old. I raised my hand and said, excuse me, I don't understand why it doesn't cost us anything to make steel just because our plants are fully depreciated. He says, that's because you don't understand finance. That was the answer he gave me. I later took an accounting course and I learned it's true. I didn't understand finance, but neither did he, okay? <laughs> the fact your plant is depreciated has nothing to do with what it costs to make something in it, okay? That's an accounting game, okay? It has nothing to do with the real cost. And so our costs were double the Japanese cost because we were building in 1911 plants that we were putting, you know, holding together with, you know, uh, you know, duct tape and a prayer, okay? And the Japanese had brand new mills that were no more than 10 or 15 years old that were most, most productive in the world, okay? And we were wondering why they could ship steel to the United States and sell it for less than we could make it. What's the shipping cost? It's been about the same for the last 30 years. What's the shipping cost to get a ton of cargo across the Pacific or across the Atlantic? You guys are, you guys are in the business of ships and you don't know? <laughs> now, $30 a ton. Okay. Yeah. Gordon Forward, who started one of these electric furnace steel companies, said he started a small, a mini mill, steel company in 1975 and everybody said how can you compete with the Japanese and their big integrated mills 15 billion dollar plants they weren't 15 billion back then they were maybe only five or ten billion uh, how can you compete uh, first of all it only cost him 250 million to build his mini mill sure it only produced one tenth one fifth or one tenth as much but it, the capital cost was less than one tenth it was about five percent okay it couldn't produce all the range of products that you could by these two technologies at the time. Um, but he used to say, if we can keep our labor costs below $30 a ton, we don't care if the Koreans pay their, their employees nothing. We can compete in the American market if we are less than, if our energy cost, if our labor costs are less than $30 a ton. Because it costs them $30 to ship them over here and their only competitive advantage was labor costs, right? That was the way he thought about it. By the way, Gordon's a graduate of MIT, uh, this department. Uh, he's retired up in Vancouver now, but he's Canadian back, by background, but anyway. Canadian? What's wrong with Canadians? No, Vancouver. Oh, Vancouver. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you do have to beat him tonight, <laughs> or you'll be just like the Miami Heat. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to see Dirk Nowitzki and Jason Kidd get a ring, right? Anyway, uh, so what are these two types of furnaces, and what's this type of furnace, and why? What's what's the big difference here that makes these things so important in this huge industry? I mean, it's, steel today is a trillion-dollar wor worldwide industry billion tons times a thousand dollars a ton. I did that math in my head. Okay? Okay, so um, before I get to that, let's talk about cupolas. Cupolas. Most of you thought of a cupola was a little thing you put on top of the barn that had a weather vane. Okay? What? You have to. You can in an electric furnace, but you can't in a open hearth furnace or a basic oxygen furnace. And I haven't told you about. I'm going to tell you about these ty types of furnaces now. The blast furnace just makes pig iron or or cast iron. It actually is carried over. You don't solidify it. That would be a tremendous waste of energy. So you carry it over in a hot metal car about a hundred tons at a time. Big railroad car. I mean, see all the see all the bogies here? 
lots of wheels on that railroad track. But it's not going but about half a mile through the plant over to the steel making. This is the iron making part of the plant. This is the steel making part of the plant. And you go to the plant, there's a couple of thousand employees in iron, or maybe a thousand employees in iron making, and maybe a thousand employees over here in steel making. Okay? This is cast iron. Lousy mechanical properties. Today, maybe $300 a ton value for the molten iron. Here, you're talking about something that's going to have a four, five, six hundred dollar a ton value, just as a casting with no shape yet. You give it shape like an I beam or a sheet with particular properties, and you're getting up to eight hundred to a thousand dollars a ton selling price. Okay? okay. And actually, the other side of this, I flip this over. They take the hot steel. I could have showed you this whole thing and they continuously cast it. That's where I started out. I was going to talk about casting. They continuously cast it. They ingot cast it. They take the pig iron and they make, they actually make pig iron which you can sell to someone to make cast iron parts. Okay? So you can cast steel, you can ingot cast steel, you can make pig iron which you're going to sell to some cast iron foundry. They're going to make parts out of it. The ingots you can do great big hot forgings. You can do an ingot breakdown mill to make blooms and make shapes and plate. You can do continuous casting to make slabs and you can do all these other things. And we're actually going to talk about all this, not just for steel, but for all metals. But I'm going to, I dwell a bit on steel because it's, it's the 900 pound gorilla. It's 90% of the metals, right? Um, and the, you know, I've been walking through steel mills for, for 35 or 40 years and it still amazes me every time I go through a mill to see the scale of things. I'm sure it amazed each of you to walk through a shipyard the first time you went through a shipyard. Well, shipyards are not the same as steel mills. They're similar, but shipyards are just a small version of a steel mill. Steel mills, integrated steel mills are big. In fact, they're the biggest things in the world. The bigger steel mills are dealing with 350 ton castings, 700,000 pound casting, largest castings made in the world. Okay? Now, the steel mill, the shipyards, they may be dealing with a 100 ton casting or something, you know, and 100 is close to 300, but it's not the same. Even bigger cranes for 300 tons. Now, you have some of the biggest cranes in the shipyard, okay? Because you actually lift whole sections that weigh a lot more than 300 tons. But in terms of components, big hunks of metal, steel mills outdo shipyards. In terms of a fabricated hunk of metal, yeah, you got bigger hunks of metal overall. Yeah, I agree. Ships are bigger than cars or railroad cars or whatever. But anyway, so let's talk about... Um, for whatever reason, because it's in the order of things, cupolas, a uh, cupola, and if you look it up in the dictionary, cupolas are these little houses with weather vanes on top of a barn or something, okay? But a cupola is also a melting furnace for cast iron. And uh, there's nothing really fancy about it. It's not all that different than the Saugus Iron Works. You put your charge up here, your iron ore and your limestone and your coal, you dump it in the top, and you have a flame where you're, and if you go over to Saugus, you'll see this in stone, okay, because they didn't have metal things to build back then. You basically heat up the bottom and you blow air in. These are called tweers, T-U-Y-E-R-E, I don't have to worry about that. Anyway, blast duct, okay? Later we're going to talk about a blast furnace. A cupola is nothing more than a small blast furnace. Saugus Ironworks, nothing more than a small blast furnace, okay? But we call them cupolas when you're just making cast iron. In the 60s, Mao Zedong in China decided he was going to industrialize China. And he started, as part of the Great Leap Forward, all the communes were supposed to have their own cast iron cupola. So instead of making pottery 
and clay utensils and pots, they were going to be able to make cast iron. Mao Zedong was leading China right into the 16th century. Okay? And by 1975, 10 years later, when he passed away and they opened up China, all of a sudden, between 75 and 85, we were flooded with little cast iron trinkets. Because every one of these commun communes now had to try to figure out some way to get some currency. And so I have a, a cast iron Christmas tree stand, okay, that was made in China. This was the beginning of made in China, right? And the modern made in China, okay? Because why did they have? They had thousands and thousands, if not a million, of these little cupolas. They weren't all very big, and they weren't all this fancy. They may have been sort of Sargas Ironworks sort of fancy. Remember, he was leading them into the 16th century, right? But they had, China had probably half of the world's cast iron capacity in these little, inefficient, environmentally unsound cupolas. Okay? Um, now they've gotten rid of a lot of that and gone upscale and they make ties. There's apparently one town in China that makes 90% of all the world's neckties. Okay? Anyway, so they learned to specialize and stuff. Um, in any case, so this is three different versions. This is just an air-cooled wall. This is a shell wall. It has an inner shell or an inner cavity where it's water-cooled. If you want to really pump stuff through there, you don't want to melt the outside walls. You have to water-cool it. And this one is even less sophisticated. It's a single shell, and they just flood the outside. You, if you come up to it, you would just see this, this curtain of water. Okay? They're just pumping Niagara Falls around this thing to keep the walls from melting. But productivity goes up as you cool the walls. Okay? And they do this same type of cooling of the walls on the huge steel blast furnaces. Not on the modern ones, but I had one in Detroit that was built in 1925 and the walls were starting to buckle. It was an old riveted structure but it was producing a hundred thousand dollars of profit or not profit a product per hour and they knew it was falling apart but no one wanted to take the to call the shot to shut it down they would shut it down once actually they would send welders up there while the thing was still hot okay and they'd be welding the shell back together the shell was buckled it was thinned down to one tenth of its original thickness Okay, they were just flooding the outside with water to keep the whole thing cool. Anyway, because hundred thousand dollars an hour, who's gonna who's gonna shut it down? No one. Not the outside consultants. Not the internal. No one was gonna take that responsibility. So they kept pushing it until it blew up one night and caused a half a billion dollar loss. Okay. Hey, insurance company paid for it. Okay. Um. <laughs> you don't like that? I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm telling you guys the way it really is out there in the world. Okay. Well, this, this is a good time for a break. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, Missouri River, whichever river. Whatever, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. 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 Oh, you couldn't get flood insurance. I mean, if, if you're in the lowlands, no insurance company is stupid enough to insure you. The only one that is stupid enough to insure you is the U.S. government. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're talking about how, how the U.S. government is going to be paying for these people back. I mean, they don't, their houses were underwater for like 60 years. Well, you know, the Arctic ice, you, you probably know, you've heard the Arctic ice cap is melting, right? And Greenland is, you know, losing. And the water level is going to rise. You can't get insurance on the coast from anybody except the US government, okay? But those people who want to have beachfront property, they're going to have sort of beach plus property plus, okay? <laughs> beach all around, it's better than being on the edge. Your taxes are going to pay for them to have those beautiful days in the summer, okay? And those days in the winter where they have to evacuate, we will rebuild their house for them. 
your taxes, my taxes, okay? Aren't we wonderful people? Anyway, okay, we'll take a break for 10 minutes. Uh-huh. Some of this. <laughs> well, now you know why it's materials processing for poets, right? Mm -hmm. I did tell you that's what I call this course, right? Now, um, because we're not getting in, you're not going to know how to process materials when you're done. But you guys are all going to be managers anyway. And in fact, you're going to be the ones where some, some chief is going to come to you and said, I got a crack in the wall of the reactor. Do you think I ought to shut it down? Okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay? <laughs> they don't know and they don't, have, they don't have the authority to shut it down, do they? Okay? They do if they think it's safety related. Only safety related. They have everything safe. <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe in the Navy, but commercially, not everything's safety. Or they rationalize it away that it's not, because no one really wants to take the responsibility for making the expensive decisions, okay? Because they know that no matter what decision they make, someone's going to second guess them afterwards and tell them they were wrong, okay? And you lost the battle, you, you know, lost the profitability in the company because you made the wrong decision. Everybody can do money, money morning quarterbacking. And the only thing that will save you is safety. I did it because of safety, okay? That's the only, that's the only defense you have, right? I mean, seriously, that's just the way it is. And it's not all that different even in Wall Street. I mean, people have to make billion dollar decisions and most people don't understand what they're doing enough that they can make an intelligent decision so a lot of times there is no decision which is the worst decision okay anyway that's that's another thing but you were asking about energy crises okay we have had energy crises um, the problem with energy crises it's the same story that investors have had for centuries you don't put all your eggs in one basket. The reason we had an energy crisis in 1973 is because we were almost totally dependent on oil as the source of energy. We had no capacity to immediately switch from oil to natural gas to coal in most of our big energy consuming industries. And when the oil supply got disrupted, all of a sudden, we had a crisis. There wasn't enough energy available because the only energy that we could use was oil. And the problem, we had another energy crisis in the early 80s, or 1978, or whatever. It was nowhere near as bad. And the reason it wasn't as bad is because the managers who had been, had, had the government come in and say, you've got to shut down your plant, you know, except in the middle of the night because we don't have enough electricity because we got oil-fired electrical plants. Um, and they, they were losing hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour because they couldn't run their plant at capacity. They said, I'm not going to let this happen again. They went out and bought insurance in the sense that they could run their furnaces on oil or gas and some of them on coal. So they diversified. And so the next energy crisis, which actually in terms of, I don't know if I could, you know, someone could probably prove this, the restraint on the amount of oil we had may have even been worse, but it wasn't felt anywhere near as bad because industry had the ability to flip the switch and change to natural gas or to flip the switch and change to coal. Not everyone had that, but you don't have to have everyone have flexibility. You only have to have some flexibility. In 1973, we had no flexibility. So what's happening today? People have been predicting for 50 years that we're running out of oil in the next 20 years. Okay? Why are we not running out of oil? There's plenty of oil still in the world, but not at $2 a barrel. It's true. We've used up all the $2 a barrel oil. The only $2 a barrel oil that's left is in Saudi Arabia. It cost, actually, it costs them, I think, about two fifty to pump it out of the ground now. You know, in Saudi Arabia, well, I heard this years ago from, in the 80s from a guy from AT&T who was working over in Saudi Arabia. They don't even meter the gas when you go fill up your car. It's just a flat rate, like two bucks to fill up the tank. 
You need you need five gallons, two bucks. You need twenty gallons, it's two bucks. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Libya, I mean, I read this stuff in Libya, it was 10 cents a gallon or something, you know, whatever it is. They don't care. The price is nothing. It's the inconvenience they have to get out of the sun or get out in the sun and fill up your car, right? Um, so, because to them, oil is cheaper than water, okay? So, anyway, what about energy crises? We've got as much heavy oil in the form of tar sands, so I say we in North America, I'm including the Canadians, we don't need hisses again, since I said Canadian, oh I said Vancouver, right? Up in Alberta, we have the tar sands, and they have almost the same energy reserves as Saudi Arabia, okay? 200, 250 years. Now, you can't get it for two dollars a barrel. I remember when I first worked on a case up there, it was about $30 a barrel, and oil was going for about $30 a barrel. And they were barely able to make do. Well, now I think, because of environmental concerns, it costs them $50 a barrel. But it's selling for 100 so they're making out. Anybody been to Alberta? Richest province in Canada, right? <laughs> Money flows like water, okay? I mean, they, they are just rolling in billions and billions of dollars, okay, of oil money, right? All the other provinces, they're all going bankrupt, but Alberta, move to Alberta. <laughs> Socialism will take care of you, right? Not in Alberta. <laughs> Not in Alberta? Oh, those cowboys, okay. Okay, anyway. It's the most American province in Canada. Well, it's because they got money. <laughs> <laughs> all the Americans have moved up there to get jobs. Except they have no towns. So anyway, right, but because they have all this oil money. It wasn't like that uh, 20 years ago when I first was up there because uh, it was, you know, when it cost you $30 a barrel and, and the price of oil was dropping down at times to $15 a barrel, you could lose your shirt. Uh, but now it's well above 50 and it's staying above 50 and they make lots of money, okay? So um, there is a trillion tons of heavy oil in the o Orinoco River Valley of uh, Venezuela, okay? Lots of oil in Venezuela. That's the light stuff. After World War II, they started shipping oil to the United States. And there's a good, good little story I can tell you sometime. It may be on some of the, on the, some of the videos, some years I tell it, about they shipped some oil up here right after World War II. And they started firing up the Boston Edison plant, which was the energy, energy generator back then. And John Wolfe, who was my thesis advisor's thesis advisor, when I was a freshman, John Wolfe had the office that I'm in now, okay? And he told me the story when I was a freshman that he got, he got a call one morning from Boston Edison. They needed a consultant because they, overnight, all the stainless steel in their whole plant had just rotted away to nothing, overnight. And he says, well, I know the answer, but it will cost you $5,000. Well, five thousand dollars in the late '40s was like two or three years' salary. It's kind of like two or three hundred thousand dollars. You know, he had, he was going to extort from them, okay, um, uh, a fair amount of money because he knew the answer, and he had been looking at impurity elements in oil for ten or fifteen years. John Wolf was German, W U L F F, and so during the war. He couldn't, um, he wasn't involved in things like the Manhattan Project, okay? But he knew there were lots of things going on in these buildings here that we're in right now that had to do with things that were, people were interested in uranium. John, John Chipman, the Chipman room's just across the, uh, the courtyard here. John Chipman was working on a crucible material to hold molten uranium. Well, no one had a use for uranium before. And John Wolfe didn't know exactly what this was all about, but at a cocktail party of faculty one, one evening, he says, you know, there's a lot of uranium in the oil in the Balkans. It was one of the impurity elements in the oils. That was what he was studying. He'd also studied oxidation of metals. Anyway, after he said, the, he told at that cocktail party about the uranium in the oil, he said there were two Secret Service agents in his office the next morning asking him what he knew about uranium. Okay? So there were people at MIT that knew about the Manhattan Project. Anyway, um, but John Wolfe didn't because he was German. 
Um, anyway, after World War II, Boston Edison, all the stainless steel went to pot, and they said, well, if you know the answer, we'll pay your fee, but this is, this is you know, we, we need to know the answer. They just lost a, a million dollar plant. Okay, what's $5,000? They needed to know. And he said, okay, after he got the, all the agreements signed, he said, last week you got your first shipment of Venezuelan oil. They said, yes. He says, Venezuelan oil contains vanadium. And vanadium forms an oxide with stainless steel that melts off the protective chromium oxide of stainless steel. And so they had just oxidized their stainless steel because the vanadium purity in the oil just ate it up overnight. And today the API has specs, the American Petroleum Institute has specs on getting the vanadium out. There is only there are only one or two alloys. Actually, there's really only one alloy. It's like a, a nickel chrome alloy that can survive vanadium. And I actually briefly got hired on a thing up in the tar sands area of Alberta because they have vanadium in their things. They have processes now to get rid of the vanadium, but back then no one really knew about it because they always had the nice crude from Texas and stuff that didn't have this problem. But John Wolfe knew about it at the right time and found the right client who had a big enough problem that he could put a couple of kids through college uh, on that one, one answer, okay? So you gotta be at the right spot at the right time. Anyway, so where did I get into that story? Um, where was I? I was gonna talk about uh, cupolas and stuff. Uh, by the way, this is a piece of cast iron. This part was shipped to me over, it was in my office when I showed up Friday night after my travels. It's just cast iron. I need it back, I have to do some tests on it. But it's part of a, a big tractor trailer and it actually holds the king pin, which is the, the pin, the big six inch diameter pin that holds the trailer to the tractor. Okay, on the fifth wheel and stuff. And this was just kind of the lockdown to keep the thing from bouncing out. And it turns out it did bounce out in one case. And uh, anyway, we don't have to get into the accident that, that it caused. But anyway, there are complex shapes that making something out of cast iron is fine. And this is just a little more on a cupola. A modern cupola, you have where you pour the material in at the top, you have different types of ceramic on each side. You have to have expansion joints. It's really hot down here where all the fuel is melting the, the stuff coming in from the top. And you have these blasts in here, just like the you, you know, Michael showed you the, the uh, bellows and you have to heat things up by blowing air in. These are tw tweers. And then every now and then you open the plug, which is just a big plug of sand or whatever here, and the cast iron comes out. You cast your pigs or you cast your little brackets or your Christmas tree stands or whatever you're making. Okay? So that's cupola technology. It's used still in bigger cupolas in lots of foundries all over the country and uh, 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 you know people who make brakes for cars uh, you know the brake calipers and things the engine blocks for cars they're typically melting in cupolas the American Foundersman Society has gone and gotten money out of the Department of Energy for more efficient cupolas that use less energy so you can be you can pay Americans more to compete against the Chinese who are making cast iron parts and paying the people nothing, okay? This is a blast furnace, not a cupola, but it basically has a little, what they call the bell up here, which is basically just a valve. You can pour your stuff in, drop the bell, and everything falls in. You have to have abrasion-resistant walls here. You have erosion all the way along here. You have thermal shock, just like the thermal expansion. The difference is this might be 20 stories tall in a steel mill. It's not a small furnace. This furnace could cost you $2 billion just to rebuild. You have these huge blowers. There's a man standing right there. Okay. Yep. What material are they making these furnaces out of? Steel shell, maybe one inch thick. Okay, there's an internal pressure of a few psi, like five five psi. The blast pressure, 
you're blowing air in there pretty fast. It's basically almost supersonic. I mean, it's, it's let's all call it sonic velocity. You're blowing in air in as fast as you can to get the fastest burning rate. You got a mixture of coke pellets, center pellets, which is the iron ore, and lumps of limestone. The limestone starts to melt, and so down here you get slag, you get a molten glass floating on top of the cast iron. Uh, actually, a molten glass of slag floating on top of the cast iron. You got the carbon mixed in here, and eventually down here at the very bottom you get this pool of iron. On one side, you take off the slag, you have a little tap, so you can get rid of the molten limestone and silica glass that came from the iron ore rock and stuff. And then a slightly lower one, believe it or not, this is a little bit lower. The whole depth of the molten stuff down here may only be three, four feet tall. Okay, here's the person. But the molten stuff may only be three or four feet. Uh, and you tap it off every now and then, about every 45 minutes to an hour. Take a couple of hundred tons off. No, actually, if you're, yeah, that's about right. In a big, a big one at a modern Japanese or Korean mill, 5,000 cubic meters, 10,000 tons a day, maybe 15,000 tons a day. One of these can produce four to five million tons of steel. Well, that's, you know, that's 0.5% of the world total out of one blast furnace, okay, per year. So you go to Pohang, the world's largest steel company, 30 million tons at one site, 3% of the world's production at one steel mill, much of it going into all the Korean shipbuilding, which is basically across the street, okay? Not across the street, it's actually maybe 10 to 15 miles away, okay? Uh, uh, but it's not very far away. They don't have to transport those, those plates very far. Um, but um, they may have five, five of these that are producing 25 million tons of steel a year, okay? But it only takes five of them. Lots of refractory here. You've got like three or four feet of ceramic refractory brick. Relining this thing, you may spend a hundred million dollars on ceramic brick, okay? Relining it takes six months. This thing will run for five years or more before you have to shut it down and completely rebuild it. The rebuild can cost you a billion dollars to completely reline it. Uh, on the smaller, older ones, and actually probably even on the newer ones, they have, uh, they have injectors where they actually can spray more ceramic on the inside walls because, hey, you hate to lose a half a year's production at, uh, you know, at a couple of hundred thousand dollars an hour. Okay, you start figuring that out. The downtime's worth something, okay? So they have all kinds of ways to try to keep these things going. And the ceramic gets eroded away over time. Okay, but the, the temperature gradient across here, I mean, you've got, well, I may have a picture of it somewhere, but you may have 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit here, and you've got a temperature out here of a couple hundred degrees. And sometimes they water cool the outside steel shell, just a sheet of water coming down, so waterfall. It's also the inside yeah, and they got, they got, uh, they weld on rods so the ceramic brick can be attached to the shell. I mean, it's a it's, it's pretty complex structure, okay? But it's a multi-billion dollar facility, okay? Now this is only part of it because, I'll show you some other pictures, but anyway. Um, let's see if I, oh, where is it? Well, the other picture, hmm, shows it here. Okay, let's go to this one. <coughs> Back, back to this one. <coughs> so here you can see the temperature difference going up. You see the gas is coming off. A lot of your coal in the steel company uh, takes about 600 pounds of coal for every ton of cast iron, okay? Um, so 600 to 2,000 pound ratio. Well, all that coal burning, you have these two stacks coming up around the, the thing that's dropping stuff in, and you ha have the gas coming down and most of this gas is coke oven gas. Or actually you have coke oven gas, which is another thing. It's blast furnace gas. And the blast furnace gas will go through one of these regenerators. And the other one, the air blast will come in through this hot regenerator to preheat the air. You have this on ships, 
okay, when you're burning, when you're not reactors, but you have, you know, steam boilers, okay, you preheat the air to get more efficient burning of your fuel. You can't get these temperatures and you, unless you have a blast. The reason is a blast furnace, you're blasting air in there, just like the old bellows in the blacksmith shop. This is a big bellows. And this brickwork here, you have two of them because one of them's being heated by the exhaust gas. It's cooling the exhaust gas and heating the brick. And the other one is heating up the incoming air. And every now and then you'll switch over, like every three or four hours you'll switch over and heat up the other one and cool down the other one. Right? So this is just energy conservation. These things are as big as the blast furnace. That's why even if this is a $2 billion furnace, which costs a billion dollars to rebuild, the whole facility for a blast furnace is probably $5 billion today because you have to have all your ore handling equipment, raw materials handling, and then you have to have all these blast stoves and stuff, they call them. Okay, it's big. I mean, it's a lot bigger than a football field. It'd probably be about 10 football fields volume. Okay, a real estate. Not a small facility. Um, but getting back to, um, if you look in something like, are you guys familiar with ASTM specs? Some of you have heard of a ASTM specs. So there's like a six volume set for steels. There's a five volume set for all other metals, <laughs> okay? Um, it's just the way it is. So back in 1998, last time I bought a set for myself, you go to MIT library, you can get the current year spec. Uh, but this is section one of ASTM. There's like 30 or 40 different sections. All the ASTM spec books would take more than the width of this room. And it's plastics, it's anything. ASTM's down in Philadelphia, and they make a fortune off selling specs. And they have committees write specs. And so if you look in here, this is on structural steel, reinforcing pressure vessel railway. And I picked out A36, garden variety, ASTM A36, garden variety structural steel. Plates, I-beams, bars. This is what a civil engineer uses to build bridges and buildings. This is 36 KSI steel yield, garden variety, and it will say somewhere in here, I found it this morning, um, that, okay, section six, process. The steel shall be made by one or more of the following processes, open hearth, basic oxygen, or electric furnace. Those are the three that we talked about before. So if garden variety, you can use any steel mill in the world to make your steel for this steel. But there are other specs in here, high strength um, steels that, like the Navy's HSLA 60 will have a spec in here. This is the one on cast irons, okay? You look at the cast irons, it's not going to tell you anything about open hearth because open hearth, electric furnace, and BOF, basic oxygen furnace, are steel making processes. And what's the difference between steel and cast iron? Cast iron melts at around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit and it's got 3 or 4% carbon. Okay? And it, in some forms, like ductile iron, it's almost as good as cast steel, but not quite in terms of mechanical properties. Um, the, the bulk of the cast iron, you hit it hard with a sledgehammer and it fractures. In fact, if you've ever seen the guys, uh, uh, the gas guys uh, repairing, a, or the water main guys repairing a gas leak, <clears throat> and they get in there, get down in the hole, they uncover this big water main, and when they need to, they don't have to go in there and saw it out, they just take a sledgehammer and they just hit it. It just shatters, okay? And that's what we got our, that's what carries the water and that's why you have big floods in Cambridge like up here, okay. But some of those, those cast iron pipes are 100 years old, so they've gotten a fair amount of service. Now, the basic open hearth. The basic open hearth, we have not built one in the world since the early 70s, but for the, for a, 
a hundred years before that or 90 years before that this was the way steel was made it took 24 hours to make 300 tons of steel okay it took forever I'm not over yet okay is it yeah we got another 20 minutes right so it took forever 24 hours to make 300 tons this is the size of a football field and here you can tap it into ladles and stuff you had big brickwork on either side the same size as this to preheat the incoming air you know recover the heat from the outgoing air and you switch over every six to twelve hours okay in your brickwork so you had three football fields for one furnace to make 300 tons of steel okay and then in uh, well actually I'll go back to this <coughs> In the 60s, a little place in Austria, this actually I think is 1958, decided to try pure oxygen and burning off the carbon. Steel is basically burning the carbon off the blast furnace. The blast furnace iron has got three, per, three or four percent carbon. You got to get it down to one tenth that value to have the steel. You got to burn off the carbon. In an open hearth, you just use air flowing over the furnace. To slowly burn off the carbon. Here you blow a supersonic jet of liquid oxygen into a molten steel bath and you burn off not in 24 hours but in 10 minutes you burn off all the carbon. So now every 45 minutes for the whole cycle you're producing 300 tons of steel in 45 minutes as opposed to three or four hundred tons in a, in a day pretty big productivity increase. It all occurred between 65, 1965 and 1980. Okay, So the steel industry had this tremendous new high productivity process. They had to have a source of liquid oxygen. Companies like Lindy will build a liquid oxygen plant right there on the steel plant grounds because this uses about 15% or 20% of all the liquid oxygen in the world it goes to making steel, burning the carbon out of the cast iron. Okay, And the plant is quite a bit smaller. <coughs> uh, you have all this stuff to take care of the gas coming off. Here's your vessel. might only be 20-30 feet tall. You have ingots here. You have ladles. You have your scrap over here. You blow, throw in some scrap. You put in molten, molten iron. You put it all in the vessel, you only fill up the bottom four or five feet of the vessel. So a person standing here, they don't have a person in this one, but a person might be uh, something like this. This might be 20 to 30 feet tall. And you only fill up about the bottom 20% of the vessel, and here's your lance for oxygen. But when you blow that oxygen in there, this thing fills up with a foam of molten steel. It's really exciting. You want to see fireworks? It, this you want to go through a steel plant okay 20 27 2800 3000 Fahrenheit foamed steel 300 tons okay it's neat okay but it's big scale okay uh, and here's an electric furnace which has been around for 120 years ever since Edison and Westinghouse and it's nothing more than three carbon electrodes Oh, about three, three and a half feet diameter carbon electrodes. Three phase electricity running at, well, the big ones today will run about 150 MVA, okay? 150 megawatts. It's actually MVA if you're an electrical engineer because it's reactive power, not, anyway. Um, but anyway, big electric arcs. Two, three hundred, four hundred volts at fifty thousand amps. Okay, you can melt a hundred tons of steel in half an hour, forty minutes. You can use a hundred percent scrap. And what's happened? Remember, we put this fifty billion tons of steel in the environment, and we're getting back each year about seventy or eighty million tons in this country. And in the world, we're getting back about 600 or 500 million tons a year of scrap. 
well, we don't need to make everything in blast furnaces anymore. And so if I went back to just 40 or 50 years ago, 80% of my iron or my steel, because the world was on a growth after World War II, as it was industrializing and rebuilding after World War II, they needed more and more steel, and there was a bigger and bigger growth. Around 1970s, 1980s, the market flattened, partly because of the energy crisis, partly because the world couldn't afford more steel. We were getting so productive that we could make so much in the plants that we had, we didn't need new plants. And that's why, since 1965, no company has been able to justify building a new plant. Only countries who are doing it for political economic reasons, not for business reasons. And so the countries would build an excess capacity, and all these other countries that had enough capacity, like the United States, were being competed against by countries who wanted to own their own steel mills. They didn't want to just buy from the United States anymore. And so all of a sudden, the U.S. steel industry was operating at 50, 60 percent of capacity. When they needed to, it's just like the airlines, you know, the airlines can't make money unless they were operating at 80, 85 percent of capacity of passengers filling seats. Well, the U.S. steel industry couldn't make money at 60 percent of capacity. When whole countries like Korea or Japan or China or Romania were building steel plants, the American steel industry couldn't afford to replace their 1911 you know, blast furnaces. They didn't have the profitability. President Kennedy helped ensure that in 1962 when he made them roll back prices. Okay? So the whole steel industry is a very complex story, but people would look at steel and from the 1980s and the 1990s, Wall Street would say, this is a dying industry, I'm interested in silicon. Okay? Do you know how many bridges have been built out of silicon? Okay. Some of us knew they would still be building steel cars, you know, steel bridges, you know, steel ships, but no one would believe that on Wall Street. They didn't believe that at NAFC. They thought they were going to build all composite ships in the future. And then they built some. And they found they didn't work so well. Okay? They found the modulus of steel had a certain advantage when you made big things. And that's the old story of the Visby, the, the, the Swedish Corvette that uh, is the world's largest uh, composite ship that you can only take out in good weather. Don't take it out in a storm, okay? That's good. As long as you have an agreement with the other side, they'll only do battle in, in good weather, you know? Right? Uh, uh, yeah. I uh, was wondering why the uh, The open hearth needs molten metal to get the reaction going. It's, it's got to build up a froth from that liquid. The liquid steel is going to react with the iron. If you, put, if, you, if you put cold scrap or even warm scrap and you blew pure oxygen on it, it would just be blowing your oxygen away. There's nothing to react until you get a liquid. So you have to have 70%. You can throw 30% scrap in the basic open hearth. Okay, not on either the basic open hearth or the uh, basic oxygen furnace, but uh, you, have, you can't put in so much that you'll freeze all your liquid. You have to have molten cast iron so that when you blow the oxygen in, the oxygen will react with it. Okay? The electric furnace, all your heat's coming from electricity. You can put cold stuff in and 100%. Okay? The problem is scrap, it's not pure. It's got alloy steel, it's got carbon steel, and the conventional wisdom was you could not make all grades of steel in an electric furnace. From a basic oxygen furnace, you're getting out virgin iron or virgin steel, and you can add alloying elements to it. So the basic oxygen furnace had fewer inclusion, it was cleaner, no, fewer non-metallic inclusions in it, uh, didn't have residual elements. I mean, I, I get a piece of small piece of steel and people say well was this made in a basic open hearth or an electric furnace all I have to do is look at how much nickel and chrome and stuff is in there because when you're using scrap you've always got a little stainless steel or whatever you know could be screws that are in the you know, stainless steel screws in something but you always have some residual elements and so a steel metallurgist can look at the composition of a, a little a, a bolt 
and tell you whether it was made by the composition by electric furnace or basic oxygen furnace. When you're remelting, you can't get all the things out, all the elements. Some of them you can burn away, and others you can't. You can't burn away anything that oxidizes, uh, that is more noble than iron. Because if you start burning away the iron, you no longer have anything of value, right? You're, if you go back to ore of iron oxide, you haven't gained much. And as a result, elements like bismuth, bismuth, they won't let near a steel mill. At the 10 part per million level, bismuth will, turn, will go to the grain boundaries of the steel and then brittle it. It'll be junk. And you can't refine it out of the steel. You can blow oxygen in it until you've burned all the iron away to nothing before the bismuth will burn away. Okay? That's just the way of the fundamentals of the chemistry of the process. However, they're going to re replace lead in solders. And a lot of them, they're using bismuth. Okay. Well, you know what that's going to do to a lot of the world's steel? It's going to make all the scrap useless. We're going to have to landfill it. But they have, we're not, we don't have enough of those bismuth alloys that are replacing the lead alloys yet. But in the next 10 or 20 years, they're going to have to segregate the scrap more carefully than they do today. Give you an example. <coughs> um, in making of aluminum, lead is just as bad as bismuth. Lead is to aluminum as bismuth is to steel. Doesn't alloy with the aluminum, goes to the grain boundaries, you try to roll the steel and it'll just crumble to pieces when you try to hot roll it. Because the lead's at the grain boundaries, it melts and this, the aluminum just falls apart into pieces. Okay. So a number of years ago, Alcoa, Tennessee, which makes a lot of canned stock, was having all kinds of problems with Mexican aluminum scrap. They traced it down. It was, they had too much lead in the Mexican scrap. And they thought the Mexicans were slugging, because they, they buy scrap by weight, they thought they were throwing lead weights, because it's cheaper than aluminum, just to get the price up. And they couldn't find it. They couldn't find it. Finally they did a more extensive study. At the time, this was like in the 90s, early 90s, the Mexicans were still using leaded gasoline. And they don't have 5% deposit laws in, in, in Mexico. People would just throw their cans along the side of the highway. Other poor Mexicans would come along, collect the cans. But if you plotted the lead concentration from the side of a highway, it died off to nothing. It was very high, right at the edge of the highway, and within 200 feet on either side, it dropped to very low values. It was the lead deposits from the auto exhaust that was getting on the cans on the side of the highway that was causing enough contamination. Alcoa quit buying Mexican aluminum scrap because they couldn't make good quality aluminum by using the recycled material from 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 Mexico because of the lead in the gasoline. Okay, took them a while to figure that one out. They knew the way the problem was, but they they finally tracked down the source. I'm sure the Mexicans probably, but now you got extra cost, right? What's the scrap worth, right? So yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean they're not just landfilling all this stuff, and I don't know. The Mexicans may have gotten away from lead in their gasoline by now. I don't know. They could, they could introduce a bottle deposit, you know? Yeah, I think they rinse it off now and they bottle that water and they sell it as bottled water. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than most of the other water in Mexico. Um, anyway, uh, so, <coughs> okay, let's malign another country. Um, so here is the history of the amount percent of total raw steel pro produced. This came out of the making, shaping, and treating of steel. Yeah, okay. Which is a U.S. steel publication. Now it's actually a American Iron Steel Institute publication. But back when U.S. steel made money, they had 10, 10 editions going back like 50 years of how do you make steel. Okay? And then the last edition, the uh, 
American Iron Steel Institute published because the steel companies couldn't afford to just do this kind of public relations publishing. But back in 1955, 90% of all the steel was base, basic open hearth. That was that's what Andrew Carnegie made his money on. 24 hours for 300 tons. And then, and this is basic open hearth. I mean, the basic means it's a basic slag rather than an acidic slag. And it makes a cleaner steel. But it dropped within, from 1960 to 1980, in 20 years, the basic open hearth shut down. About 1970, when it was clearly a dead process, U.S. Steel built the world's largest basic open hearth, a 450-ton furnace in Pittsburgh. Clever management, okay? The rest of the world had seen the trend, but not U.S. Steel's management, okay? Um, the basic oxygen process, which is this one that uses a supersonic oxygen jet and makes everything in 20 minutes, took everything over in that same, same amount of time. The electric furnace actually was growing. And this is because scrap became more and more available. We had been putting so much steel into the environment, we were getting more and more scrap back. And a whole series of new mills called mini mills replaced the integrated mills starting in the 1970s. Because some of these guys, like Gordon Ford or Ken Iverson at Nucor, realized you could buy scrap at $100 a ton. You could buy pig iron at $200 a ton. Both of them end up making steel as the raw material for steel. Which one do you use for your, process, your, for your uh, plant to make steel? The $100 a ton product or the $200 a ton product? Duh, okay, and that was the growth of the mini mills from 1975. Today, about 50% of the steel made in the United States is, comes from electric furnace mills. The conventional wisdom at the steel companies, hey, I was one of these employees back then, was that you couldn't make the same quality steel. All they could ever make was garbage steel. They could, they might be able to make kids little red wagons, you know, they could make concrete reinforcing bar or something, but they couldn't make automotive sheet. They couldn't sell to General Motors, okay? And therefore, they were never going to be important. And that's why Clayton Christensen published in his book, Innovator's Dilemma, and he, he, he defends the steel industry as these great paragons of managerial wisdom who were torn between integrated f producing produ uh, production and electric furnace production and it's the innovator's dilemma. Do they go and try to do like the mini mills? And he, he presents it as if it was a real question that someone with a brain would, would have to think about, okay? <laughs> but in fact, it was obvious to anyone. I remember another person that I knew when I was a graduate student, a guy, Kim Clark. Kim Clark became the dean of Harvard Business School. Okay, and Kim and I, our wives were best friends. I mean, his, his son knocked my oldest son's teeth out twice in six weeks, okay, on the playground, okay? Um, and I remember going to a meeting with Kim once, and this was when I didn't have money to feed my family, and Kim had just gotten back from Disney World with his family, and he was down there lecturing to the, to the American Iron Steel Institute, the presidents of all the all the AISI companies. This was back like 1980, okay? I said, well, Kim, what are you telling them about? I mean, Kim had studied labor economics, okay, at Harvard. And Kim, you know, he helped me build a Pinewood Derby track for scouts. It's the only track of the four that doesn't go straight, okay? Kim doesn't quite know <laughs> which end of a screwdriver to use, right? Okay? He's not mechanically inclined, okay? He's not technically inclined. And he was explaining to them about this dilemma of uh, should they put in uh, ingot casting versus continuous casting, which is something I haven't brought up yet. But ingot casting versus continuous casting was a process in 1970 that was absolutely obvious you could go from 65% yield to 95% yield on your steel. And so is, does it take a, a genius to know which one would you rather have? Okay. 
but Armco Steel, it's a dilemma, okay? The, for a businessman, it's a dilemma, okay? Armco Steel decided to put in ingot casting. And three years later, after they built it, it takes about three years to build a plant, and invested a couple hundred million dollars, they decided they were going to have to put in continuous casting. Now, anyone with a brain would have known before. But Kim said, well, he was defending this dilemma, okay? And he was telling these managers how, how difficult this decision that they had to make was. Well, of course you tell them they're paying your consulting fee, okay? And you're not going to tell them they're idiots, okay? My problem in my profession is I will tell them they're idiots, okay? But, in fact, they were idiots, okay? But Kim became dean and, you know, here I am lecturing to you. But at least I have my integrity, okay? <coughs> Ow. I'd rather be lecturing to you, believe me, uh, uh, than sitting in those meetings. But anyway, this is the trend in the industry. It's all BOP and, and electric furnace. But you'll still see in the specs, because the specs were written 80 years ago, that that's how you can do it. So, <coughs> um, let me just show you, there's lots of variations on the BOP process. Um, the bath level is way down here. You can blow hydrocarbons and oxygen in the bottom. This comes out of the U.S. Steel Book, so they like to talk about the QBOP process, QBOP, and that's bottom blowing um, rather than all top blowing, so you can you can get a froth from the bottom rather than from the top. It's a little more efficient, but it's a co more complex process. Uh, here's the QBOP furnace. The problem with the QBOP furnace, you have to blow all times, even when you're not blowing oxygen, you have to have a flame coming in here so the steel doesn't leak out the bottom. <laughs> so you have to have enough pressure to keep it from leaking out. Here is, this just take a second. Uh, here are the different sized vessels. From 1964, Allegheny put in an 18-ton vessel. McLeod put in a 60-ton vessel in 54. Now, these were sort of experimental things back then. Um, by 73, Bethlehem put in a 300-ton vessel. And these are all on the same scale. It doesn't get a lot bigger because it goes as the cube of the dimension, right, for the volume that's in there. But this actually comes out of the the making, shaping, treating of steel actually gives you the times for making, charging, putting the, the hot metal in the, the scrap in the furnace five or ten minutes, refining, blowing about 15 or 20 minutes, sampling, you have to sit there and wait because you're, you're changing the chemistry so quickly you have to go in there, take a sample and get a full chemical analysis that will take four to 15 minutes. Okay, and it's worth a fortune. This facility is turning out steel at a value of a quarter million dollars an hour. Okay, so a few minutes is worth a lot of money. If you got a faster way to do the chemical analysis, or if you could do it in situ, a guy over here in building 12 was working for years trying to take the chemical analysis machine and put it right down that lance into the 3,000 degree furnace. Never worked, but. He was trying to figure out how to do it. Tapping, which means pouring the steel, four to eight minutes, pouring the slag off. So you put all this together, about 45 minutes to make 300 tons of steel. Pretty productive. And the guy doing it, has, if he's lucky, has a high school diploma. In 1975, I got thrown out of the shop at the Sparrows Point the BOP shop at the Sparrows Point shipyard, not shipyard, but steel plants right next to the shipyard. Um, when the guy found out I was from MIT and had a doctoral degree, he threw me out of the, threw me out of the pulpit. And they were, they were casting a special heat of steel for a LNG carrier and I had developed the steel and I, was, I had gone down there. It's a, it's a little bit longer story. But because when he found out that I actually had a degree that he didn't have, he threw me out of the pulpit. I couldn't be there while he melted the steel. And the steel came in off chemistry, okay? But he was one of the highest paid employees at Bethlehem Steel. Back in the mid-70s, he was making probably 100000 a year as a hourly employee. But he was responsible back then for $100,000 an hour worth of product and getting it right. I still wonder if he got it wrong just to spite me, okay? 
I hadn't said anything to her. What it was is, I will tell you what I did. There was no one there. It was a slow time after the oil embargo. And we came in, there was one chair in the pulpit. And there were three of us, and I went and sat in the chair. And when he came back in, I stood right up immediately and welcomed him, you know, said hello to him. But he was very upset that I had been sitting in his chair. And then when he found out, I asked him, I asked him, I said, well, I, I was looking at your, your process sheet, you know, the plan for how they're going to make the sale. I said, you're going you're gonna to shoot for the high end of the range or the low end of the range? He says, what are you? He says, you got one of those degrees like Sully? And Sully was an MIT metallurgist. And he was head of the melt shop, engineers, okay? He's like, yeah, you got, you got uh, and I, I had a hard hat. I should have brought it with me. Still have it in my garage at home. It said T.W. Eager Research White. They could tell the difference. That was white for management. And so the crane operators could make a better hit, okay, if they were dropping something. Um, anyway, he, uh, he says, you like Sully? You go to MIT? <laughs> and my boss, who had also gone to MIT, <laughs> he breaks out laughing. And the next thing we know, the guy walks out of the shop. In comes one of Sully's engineers and said, you guys better get out of here. And so I got thrown out of the melt shop because I asked a question and I was sitting in his chair. So you may have met some people like that in your, in your day too. Okay, okay, let's see. Actually, I don't think, I will be back. I'm not here the rest of this week. I'm going to visit the army and see how they blow up uh, uh, vehicles in uh, Afghanistan. Um, I think I'm, <laughs>